Hi, is this Jackie? Yes, it is. All right. Well, let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. We have been talking about her and really her family for the past half hour. We are so excited to welcome uh, actress and author who you know from Monos, Hands of Fate, and of course the new Monos Returns, the one and only Jackie Neiman Jones. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. You know, really, if you think about Monos, the Hands of Fate, for you, whenever you watch it, and I don't know how many times you watch it over and over, it's kind of like watching home movies for you, isn't it? <laughs> oh, and I even said that in my book. It's like the whole story is it, it is like a home movie for me. My whole family was involved, including the dog and the car. Oh, we have to turn around and uh, give out a little bit of trivia here because I thought this was funny because I was talking about, you know, the movie and the dog and getting paid. And Tiffany said the only two people, or the only two characters, if you will, because one's not a person, the only two characters <laughs> yeah. in the movie that was paid was you and your dog. Yes, uh, yeah, he got a 50-pound bag of dog food, <laughs> and uh, not, pr not premium either, but... <laughs> And then I got a um, my first bicycle, little red bicycle with training wheels and uh, streamers. And I've got pictures of that, but uh, yeah, we were the only ones. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, too, because you had reflected uh, th that you didn't even think the filmmaker, I, I'm taking the, the bike came from him, you didn't even think that he was really kind of a father-like figure that, that you thought he didn't have any children you found out he had kids you said he kind of treated yeah. you like a prop right he treated <laughs> you you know in a way badly well not badly but he was a busy man and um but yeah he would just kind of bend over and pet me on the head like a puppy or <laughs> pick me up and move me one place to the other you know wherever he wanted me to be but you have to understand he was under so much pressure and stress on this thing that I I honestly don't know how he pulled it off. Right. Now let's kind of start out uh, from the beginning uh, for our listeners. I'm assuming, I'm just assuming that everybody at this point has seen Mono, so it has kind of become infamous. Uh, but if we go back to the beginning, I mean, you were six years old when you guys did the film. First of all, how much of the whole experience do you really remember, and how did mom and dad come and explain to you what you guys were doing? I mean, did you even comprehend what making a movie was at that time? Uh, I didn't comprehend what making a movie was, but my dad had been in theater my whole life, so I was very used to being around uh, the theater crowd, and in El Paso, the festival theater was really quality. I mean, it was very good community theater. And uh, so when my dad asked me, he said, Honey, uh, some people and I are making a movie and we need a little girl. Would you like to be that little girl? And I was a pretty shy kid, so I just very quietly said, I don't know. And he said, It's okay, honey. You don't have to. We'll just get another little girl. And I was like, Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> No other little girls hanging out with my daddy. Um, but I was a, I'm an artist. I'm, you know, that's what I do for a living, what I've always done. And I'm in a very observant person. I think I'm a lot like my dad. And um, I mean, in the future after that, my dad went on to, he was uh, a very depressed human and suicidal. And I was very, very attached to him mm -hmm. and observant. And during those days when Manos was happening, I paid very close attention to everything he did in his art studio and my mom. So I have very clear memories of them laying out the fabric and making the Manos robe. Plus, my mom taught me to sew. So I really understood, you know, in hindsight, I understood what they were doing. Right. And then I remember being in his, he had a little rock house out in the, our backyard. That was his studio space. And he allowed me to sit on a stool and watch him, and, which I did all uh, every opportunity I got. And I watched him make that Torgo staff. I remember him. Uh, Torgo's uh, clothing was my dad's uh, welding coveralls, mm. <laughs> you know, that he used. Uh, to make the Torgo staff, and I remember him painting the painting. I have so many memories, and 
fortunately, I wrote my book, Growing Up with Monos, a few years ago while everything was still very fresh. But you also have to understand that because Monos disappeared, mm. it showed and then it just disappeared. So I really preserved those memories. I held on to them because I never thought I'd see it again. It well, you remember quite a bit to the, to the point, and I guess this shows your creativity at an early age and, and shows that you're a natural born filmmaker yourself that back when you were doing uh, monos and you were you know six years old and around that, that you said that you really knew in your head even as a child that the movie was pretty bad and you kept wanting to do <laughs> scenes over again and and the filmmaker uh harold hell warren didn't want to do it over he just said we'll fix it in post right Right. Well, like I said, my dad was in theater, and uh, he was very sweet. As I grew up, there were times I was able to go to the theater, and I, I was so happy just spending the whole day there, behind stage, poking through stuff, sitting in the audience, watching the rehearsals. I used to help him run his lines. So even at six, I knew what quality theater looked like, and mm. this just didn't quite look that way. <laughs> Well, I thought you were very good, and, and it, it's amazing that you came out of this whole thing, you know, without being traumatized or whatever, uh, because oh. what about the scene, for instance, to where uh, your pet dog that rode in the car, the dog was, like, massacred and chopped up, cut apart, if you will, kind of smashed. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, that wasn't a real dog now, right, that was killed? No, no. See, so Peppy, the poodle, was uh, how Warren. Pet, wow. Helen, his wife. That was their dog, and the Doberman was our family pet. And uh, so Peppy the Poodle, man, he was uh, he was an ass. I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> the Doberman, he was a sweetheart, but Peppy was not. You know, he didn't really like kids, which was another reason I thought Hal didn't have children because <laughs> the dog didn't seem to like children. <laughs> uh, but so. <laughs> So I'd have to hold this dog. Anyway, when for that scene when they were going to kill Peppy, that day Hal brought the um, oh a stuffed animal, you know, a uh -huh. stuffed black poodle. So it was approximately the same size, and he showed it to me. And when they set it up, they tore its little belly open and exposed its um, you know stuffing, <laughs> and then they poured the fake blood on it, which kind of turned it pink, you know. I wasn't at all impressed. I remember that. <laughs> I, he, he's going, now, honey, I want you to know we're not really killing Peppy. And I'm rolling my eyes thinking, yeah, obviously. <laughs> I mean, so, I don't know. I think people um, really underestimate six-year-olds. And, and the truth is, I, that summer I turned seven, so I was actually ah. much closer to seven. But, um, yeah, I think people really underestimate kids. <laughs> well, I, I definitely think the poodle was not as good an actor as your dog, which was the Doberman. No, but I have to I have to tell you, Jackie, there was there's one particular scene, I was telling our listeners this before we got on the phone with you, there's one particular scene in Monos where, you know, your dog was supposed to be, you know, in, like foreboding and like mean, and right. literally, like it's a close up of your dog, and he's just wagging. He's got the butt wiggles. He's all, <laughs> he's oh, all happy. I'm like, that's hilarious. He is the most adorable, non-threatening Doberman I've ever seen in my life. Right. <laughs> oh, he was he was a wonderful dog, and and I have to say too that my family, my dad's family, were registered with the Osage tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, originally out of Oklahoma, uh, or originally out of Missouri, but uh, forced march to Oklahoma. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> the dog's name is Shanka, and that's actually, uh, it's more like Shonga, but from what I understand is it literally means dog in the Osage language. So Shanka's dog is similar to Mono's hand. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now, from what I understand, didn't Manos, the, the whole film, didn't that start as like a bet? That's what I understand. I just posted on my Facebook page, I was talking to Richard Brandt. He's, he's like the first uh, Manos historian. And uh, Manos came out on MST in January 1993. And he wrote his article, The Hand That Time Forgot, in 1997. And he actually found uh, 
Bernie Rosenblum and um, um, oh shoot, I just went blank. But uh, oh, Bob Goodry, who is the director of photography or the cinematographer, the camera guy, mm -hmm. and uh, Bernie was the stunt man and the kissing teenager in the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he did this amazing article about and and was able to actually talk to these guys and get a lot of background stuff from them. And I just forgot the question. <laughs> Yeah, no, this, the movie started out as a bet, essentially. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so what uh, Richard found out by talking to these guys was that, um, and I always understood it as a bet between Sterling Silicent, who did In the Heat of the Night, mm -hmm. and Cal Warren. Uh, according to these guys, though, they actually became friends and had a number of conversations about it. So... Um, See, Hal never set out to make a good movie. I mean, he knew that he didn't have the budget mm -hmm. or the experience, but he felt that El Paso was this amazing place and had amazing talent, and uh, he thought that he was going to bring the film industry to El Paso. That was really his main goal, mm -hmm. which obviously didn't happen, but <laughs> um, a few good movies were... What was that one? There's a... Oh, Paul Newman, and anyway, there's there's a couple good movies that happen around El Paso. Possib just, possibly Cool Hand yeah, Luke, cool maybe. Hand Luke, I yeah. Think, yeah. Yes, yeah. I believe so. I believe that's it. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I think your movie stands up with that other famous Texas movie, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> <laughs> and that's saying oh, I saw that, yeah. <laughs> but I was surprised. Now, I know low budget and everything, but back then, to me, I thought. Nineteen thousand dollars was quite a bit of change, and, and it was hard for me to believe that all that went into the movie. I mean, the movie was good, and I certainly loved it. I love these kind of films, but man, that that to me was a fairly good bus budget, wasn't it? That's a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, I know we had to it was different back then. You had to buy film, you had yeah. to rent the cameras. Um, but as far as I know, Judge Coldwell's property where it was filmed was. Um, loaned to him for no charge. In uh -huh. fact, uh, Judge Coldwell later went and he saw a bunch of stuff laying around there. He wasn't too happy with <laughs> with the way they left it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, I never really thought about it. That's, that was a heck of a lot of money in those days. So, who knows? Well, Maybe must... that was a, a nicer bike than I thought. Wow. <laughs> now, after the film uh, debuted, you had talked about how it kind of just disappeared and went into obsolescence. Now, you had told me a, uh, a, a fun story, Jackie, uh, previously when we talked like a week or two ago about how you, and at the time, your dad rediscovered and refound the film. I was wondering if maybe you could share that experience with our listeners. Oh, sure. Yeah, so it was, uh, I believe it was January. It was 1993, and I was living in Northern California, married and had a young child, my first son. And uh, my dad was living up on the, the coast of Oregon near Lincoln City, and he was doing handyman work and such. So that Sunday, he's taking a nap in his easy chair and watching uh, Comedy Central and Mystery Science Theater, which is a show that he really liked. He, he watched it often. And he's half asleep, and he suddenly hears this familiar music and opens his eyes and sees himself on the screen oh. and I'll tell you I had been looking for that movie since I was in high school my high school friends remember the stories this way before internet and I was calling university libraries film schools I was just trying to find it and it was not out there and then he calls me after he's finished watching it and he says you're never going to believe what I just saw on television so I immediately turned on the television and I called that 800 number that is in the corner of the screen for Comedy Central. And this guy answered the phone, said his name was Matthew, and that he was in the HBO offices in Manhattan. And I said, um, you just showed this movie I've been looking for my whole life. My whole family was part of it. Is there any way I can get a copy? And he asked me the name of it and I told him. And I'm just shaking. Yeah. I can't believe I'm this close to it. And he said, and then there's this long pause. I thought he hung up on me or that we were disconnected and I was going to have to get the courage to 
call back. And all of a sudden, he blurts out, he goes, oh, my God, <laughs> are you Debbie? <laughs> 27 wow. years, and that's the first thing I hear. I was like, what? I was <laughs> speechless. So then he says, absolutely. He says, that's our favorite bad movie here in the HBO offices. And I just had a copy on my desk the other day. I'd be happy to. So he sent it to me. I still have it. It's, it's a bootleg VHS copy that he sent me. <laughs> and you know, back in those days, we used to write for different magazines that covered movies and stuff and work with networks. And that's what they did. They sent crappy VHS screeners. <laughs> now, I've got several several of them. Oh, I'm very cool. Okay. I'm surprised you couldn't find the film, though. I mean, maybe you went to the wrong places. Because, see, you should have went to people like me that really... Because <laughs> I had yeah, models before that. Yeah, not a few people did. But, like, uh, Ben Soliday, who did the restoration of Monos, he found it, uh, he found the original distributor, and he actually found the original film that went to the camera in 1966. Ah, uh, wow. And that's what he restored. So now you can see it without MST. It's beautiful. It's not a better film, but it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so even though it well, kind of like shot you to fame again, I, I often ask people that, that made films, especially since you know, this is your family singing and this and that. Uh, what did you think of uh, the MST version of, of your film? I mean, do you think it added to it or it took it away? Because to me, a lot of times I want to see the film and it's like they need to shut up. And other times I want to hear what they have to say. Yeah, you know, Monos never would have got popular if it weren't for them. I mean, I give them all the credit. I know a lot of people like the restoration. A lot of people have seen it, but... Um, you know, Manos is not a good film, yeah. and <laughs> and uh, I'm, um, you know, what's cool for me is I was such a young child that I don't have to take any responsibility. I can just say <laughs> that um, I don't, I just get to enjoy all of it and, <laughs> and say, well, you know, if you can't. If you can't be the best, make the most of being part of the worst, you know? Right. That, that's like my favorite quote in an interview ever where you was like, I was six going on seven. It's not my damn fault. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I was just a kid. <laughs> but you know, my dad, my dad has so much fun with it. And I have to tell you, we were estranged for many years. His wife and I did not get along, right. and she basically kicked me out of the family many, many, many years ago. And when Monos, uh, when I started getting opportunities with Monos, people wanted to interview and the restoration, all these things, that for some reason was the only thing that she would allow us to do. And I have to tell you, for like 15 years, we lived half a mile from each other wow. and weren't allowed a relationship. Mm -hmm. But we made our relationship because of Mono. And that's, you know, that's family. Yeah. You know something? Let me tell you something. You know, aside from the fact that, that you were six going on seven and you were very good, your dad was the best actor in that film. Your dad was better than that movie. He really was. Oh, he was good. You should have seen him. During his career, he played Don Quixote in Man of La Mancha. He played R.P. McMurphy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Mm. He was, oh, I remember uh, Julie Adams. You know Julie Adams. Yeah, from yes. uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. Of course, yeah. Yes. Yes. Back then, uh, another man was the director of the community theater, Ken Lettner, and he hired Julie Adams and brought her from L.A. to El Paso to play the prime, to play Gene Brody in the prime of Miss Gene Brody. Mm -hmm. And my dad played the lead with and I got to be one of the school girls and I forgot my one line almost every night wow. <laughs> well we want to so talk nervous. we want to well, talk I, more I, about the original but I, I think this is a yeah. good time to mention that you talked about how Manos really kind of brought you and your dad back together you really had the the ultimate reunion and it was on screen for fans because you had the opportunity you, you uh, approached somebody at Crypticon and, and uh, brought up the possibility of doing a sequel to Monos and the most blessed thing, and I guess he didn't live long enough to see the completion of the film, but your dad was in a sequel you made to Monos, right? Yes, 
And he got to see, he did get to see it. Oh, okay, great. At a screening, so he did get to see it. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very thrilled with that, and I made the master robe that he's wearing in it, because uh, my mom made the original costume right. mm -hmm. and taught me to sew, so I make it just the way, I always say, I make it just the way my mama made the original. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that was wonderful. He had so much fun. And uh, speaking of that, we, um, you know, it's taken a while because trying to find a distributor and then we all got done with that and ran off into our own projects and such. But we just talked again today. We've been um, communicating with somebody and I, I think we got it figured out. We're going to, Miles Returns will be out soon. And then there's other projects as well. Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I, I know that there's something going on too called the Debbie Chronicles. What can you tell us about that? Yes, uh, Will Polson, who lives in Yosemite, we met oh, a couple of years ago, and she presented an idea. She's doing a, an award-winning web series right now, which I cannot believe, I can't remember the name of, um, but uh, she wants to do, she's doing a web series called The Debbie Chronicles, and I star in it, and um She's going to start a, um, oh, a crowdfunding here pretty soon. But um, let me see, I wrote a couple notes here. Debbie Chronicles, yeah. So it's written by Willow and R.D. Hall, who did some work on the Heroes comic book. Oh, yes, yeah. And, um, and she's already written the pilot episode and sent it to me, but they entered it in a, in a contest, a script competition called Camera, camera, dirty, camera, dirty with camera and like camera, camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, they were actually a semifinalist. If they had won the top prize, it would have paid for the whole shoot, mm -hmm. <laughs> an 18 day shoot. Ah, but still, they came in as a semifinalist. So I'm very proud of that. And um, she's hoping for that to actually come out next spring. Wow. And then there's uh, the Monos remake, which I just recently learned about. Um, these guys that are doing the remake. Oh, in 2015, they did a remake of Plan 9 from Outer Space right. called Plan 9. It's mm -hmm. actually on Prime Video. And I heard about them and the remake of Monos, so I watched it, and it's actually pretty good. I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. I thought they did a great job. And I got hold of them, so now I'm creating the master's robes for them, some other costumes and props, uh, probably the Torgo staff, which I've made a number of, just like my dad made the original, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I get the cameo in it as well. Fantastic. Now, we want to find out, as far as the continuation of your character, Debbie, which was in Models Returns, and then uh, Debbie uh, in the Debbie Chronicles, and we don't quite know yet what we're going to be doing with the... Uh, the, the Monos remake where the people did Plan 9, but in uh, uh -huh. Monos Returns, it, it was kind of like Evil Debbie, like you were growing up. Of course, yeah. you were one of the brides at the end of the original film, and, and you were yeah, evil. But in the new thing, the Debbie Chronicles, I heard you're going to be good? Yeah, so in the Debbie Chronicles, I have escaped the Valley Lodge, and now I'm out battling supernatural evil in the world. And so it's going to be about... Uh, 80% drama, I understand, and 20% comedy. There'll be some definite comedy in it. Uh, you'll have to watch Kolchak the Night Stalker, because that's pretty much what he did. He was out battling. It was like Monster of the Week. Whatever monster he would go after, and that's pretty much what you're going to be doing with that. That sounds exciting. Okay, that's great. Yeah. That's got to be... so. I think it's... Yeah. That's got to be really surreal. I mean, when you turn around and, and did Models Returns now, here you were six going on seven, and it was a whole different thing. I mean... What really was your inspiration? I mean, that's a crazy question. I kind of hate that question. But everybody asked yes. it. So what was your inspiration for doing Evil Debbie in Models Returns? Well, I i mean, I, we did toss the script around quite a bit, but I didn't write the script, but I agreed with it. It made sense. It's yeah. like a kid that grew up in that environment, you know, what kind of good role models does she have, <laughs> you know? 
what's she going to become? And so it just seemed like evil was a good direction. <laughs> there you go. Well, it must have impressed some people. I understand that the uh, the, the filmmaker, Hal, I, I guess he got like beat over the head by some lady's purse and she was mad that they made you one of the brides at the end. I, I don't know. That could just be urban myth. I, I couldn't actually guarantee that. I have no idea. No. But it wouldn't surprise me. Now, see, Hal could have argued that, it, well, it wasn't really Jackie because I guess there was, you didn't know, but your voice actually wasn't in the movie, right? Yeah, no, that's right, because actually all the women's voices, Diane Marie, who played my mother, my voice, the kissing girl in the car, and all of the wives were all dubbed by one woman, and that was Hal's sister-in-law. <laughs> Who actually was an opera singer. Couldn't tell, but he was. <laughs> Why did they decide to, to do that? Did, was it easier to do it in post? Or? They, they couldn't afford microphones? or <laughs> what? I, Yeah, I don't know. It was just all shot wild. It was There was no sound. That was Hal's intention to begin with. I guess the... I, I don't know why he chose that, but um, it was just Hal... And my dad and I had thought John Reynolds went too, but there's a little, I'm not sure if that's actually John's voice or not, mm -hmm. but uh, my dad and Hal and maybe John were the three men. They drove from El Paso to, uh, I believe it was Austin, Texas. That's like 800 miles. Wow. And that's where they went to a sound studio and... Uh, did all the voices and the sister-in-law actually lived there so she was already there but um i don't know i don't know why he shot it wild probably because it would have been a lot more equipment and you know hard to control sound in an outdoor environment well tiffany noticed that some of the females almost tell about the, the voice change right well yeah and it was like uh it, it, well it was a voice change it might have been the same person that did it but in one scene where you see like the couple making out there's like one in one voice and then when they go to another scene and they come back the female in the couple her voice is different and it sounded almost like she overdid the accent or something i was like why is the voice oh. different from one scene to <laughs> another <laughs> can you imagine how confused that poor woman oh, was yeah. she probably she probably never even seen the script before they're standing there in front of a microphone my my you know? very my very favorite continuity uh, error was the couple's making out in the car and it's daytime and they're harassed by the cop and everything and then we go to the then we go to the lodge and it's nighttime and, and you know it's another and they come back and the couple's still there kissing it's been now, like a couple days and they're in the car for like overnight kissing and there's still and then he never got past first base either so you know yeah well he talked about that I actually talked to Bernie before he passed back in you know, the day, in the early days of this thing taking off. And uh, anyway, uh, that was Joyce Moyer. She she was to be one of the wives. I guess there was going to be seven wives, uh -huh. one for each day of the week. And uh, they added that scene in because before filming, she broke her leg. So she's in a full leg cast, wow. like up to her thigh almost, in that little car. So Bernie said it wasn't near as much fun as it looked. But they, um, yeah, they created that scene and inserted it just to have her stay in the film. Well, if her leg was broke, that explains why they never got past first base. So. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, and I was just thinking, she got to stay in the film and not get paid like everybody else. Wow. You know, I wanted to talk about, there was one sad thing that came about. Uh, and, and you remember him as a child. I guess he was very kind to you would fall down and, and make you laugh and this and that. But John Reynolds, who was so great as, as Torgo, uh, actually committed suicide, right? He did. Yes, yes. Just one month, um, one month to the day, I believe, before the premiere. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he lived just oh, less than half a mile from us down the road. I remember going over to his house with my dad a few times. He'd come over to our house. They were friends. They, John was a very serious young man and very serious about acting and his art. Um, 
his dad was an Air Force colonel, and I, I mean, and John was also not a very large man. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Just I understand he just had a lot of trouble with his dad. And now, underneath the, the makeup and stuff, he he wasn't a very old guy. I mean, he was a young guy. Yeah, I think he was twenty-seven. Ah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he was young. Now, rumors run rampant, and I don't know if you know, and, and, you know, because people want to find out, that the quirkiness of his character, because he really was over the top, which you have to be in this kind of film. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people have said that he was on LSD, that he had problems with drugs. Is that true? Yes. Yes. Oh. He definitely, I remember going over to his house with my dad and him being just totally zoned out one time, but... um yeah, he favored LSD. I mean, you know, and, and it was the time, 1966. Right. And um, that was how he coped. And I think that even though he was uh, very serious about his acting, he saw the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, and uh, probably just decided to enhance his character and, and have a good time at the same time. Well, you know... <laughs> It's it's too bad because like especially the outcome, but it really made the character quirky. I mean, yeah, I seriously, I, I guess he did it for art. Let's say okay in re, in respect. Yeah. it's just really too I bad. Think so. I would think so. I mean, you think about the times. I mean, the artist and the the, the type of environment it was. People were reaching out and and exploring a lot. So it wouldn't be unusual for something like that to happen I think I guess like you and your mom was driving in the car and your mom heard it on the radio the local news and whatever and she broke down crying we both did yeah mm -hmm. we were on our way to school my mom at the time was a teacher at Ben Milan school I was in second grade and uh, that was on the on the base of Fort Bliss the the army base you know just in El Paso and yeah. so we were on our way to school I was second grade and uh we heard it on the radio and yeah my mom just pulled over and burst into tears and i realized what happened oh that was a hard day still yeah. had to go to school because she was a teacher yeah, it's too, too bad he never lived long enough to realize you know how legendary this thing became to the to the point that you talked about how the film disappeared and, and this happens a lot because we we have a lot of uh children of directors and children of actors and this and that and a lot of times there's there's legal disputes in that and despite the fact that the movie's definitely public domain because you said yourself they never copyrighted it I guess some relatives of Harold P. Warren uh, had a lawsuit going on trying to get back the rights because they didn't like the yeah. fact that it was making money now right uh, but it's not I mean it's making money for somebody I mean none of us yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but you know that's not I mean, I'd, I'd like to do more with it, but I understand it's in public domain, and I understand that anything that I benefit from this film is on my own, right. you know, and, I, and I've been doing that, you know, yeah. making monos robes. I've made 16 of them so far, I, and they're uh, signed and numbered, but yeah, there was a, 2015, October 2015 Playboy magazine did an eight-page article called The Battle Over the Worst Movie Ever Made. Mm -hmm. And it was about uh, how Warren's son, and it's not his kids, it's just the one, mm -hmm. and uh, and he was he was just kept coming after me, he just kept harassing me for one thing. And then when the restoration came out, he kept insisting that he should own it and he should get the rights. And... It's just ridiculous because the whole thing was never copywritten. I don't. I don't so, think you are worried, but let me assure you, he's just blowing. Oh, I'm definitely not worried. Yeah, he's just blowing hot air out of his ass. There's not a damn thing he no, can do. No. Okay, no. He can't. It's over. It's over. And you know what? After the Playboy article in 2015, I never heard another word from him, and I don't care if I do. I mean, y you know, he, how Warren took. The robe and the painting that my dad did home with him, and my my dad never even got his own property back. Right. You know, he not only didn't get paid, but he didn't even get some of his work back. You know that he did for the film. So 
You know, in his honor, I've I've done three different versions of the master and dog painting. One of them is Frank Zappa with a poodle as the master. <laughs> oh, that's great! That's great! Wow! <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you know, I I don't need that stuff. I inherited my dad's talent, and that's what I'm going on. I just I'll keep. You know, the master is with us always. Right. That's right. The, the painting thing, as I looked at your renditions, and, and it's great. It's really great. You're very talented. Uh, is that something that just was naturally born into you from your dad, or did your dad actually teach you anything? No, just uh, just from being around him. I mean, I've just been creative my whole life. I do all kinds of things. I just, I'm uh, kind of manic that way. I do just so many different things. If I think of it, I'm doing it. It's like, you know, I paint rocks and then I leave them out for people to find. I make master's robes. I've made dog robes with the master. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you wouldn't believe it. I, oh, I did. I did baby onesies. Oh yeah. Oh, that's perfect. Like I have a picture of my my grandson who's now five wearing when he was a baby. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, the, the 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 Torgo staff, anything that my parents created in that film, I've pretty much recreated. Wow. And more. Much, much more. <laughs> now, you wanted to dispute with Jackie about uh, the hands of... <laughs> Hands of Fate and Hand of Fate. We we rewatched the film recently, Jackie. Last and night. We were sitting there watching oh. it and, you know, having fun with it and everything like that. And at one point, I just paused the film and I looked at Terry, who's my father, and I said, what the hell? Why is this movie called The Hands of Fate? There's only one hand. There's one Satan's hand in it. It should be the hand of fate. What is this hands of fate? Because your your dad had a hand that was burning, and we yeah, was figured that was yeah. the hand of fate. But there wasn't. Yeah. There was only one hand. There's one so hand. It's, it's, not, it's plural. not plural. It's supposed to be singular. <laughs> well, what do you expect? It's terrible. I mean, what do you <laughs> well, and then and then my next thought was, I know that. Tom had to do all of this himself and when the, the hand was on fire and he's like tossing it back and forth I'm thinking oh my god I wonder how many times he burned himself yeah he might have <laughs> yeah I actually made a hand very similar to that a burned up hand it's very cool and uh, I made it for Monos Returns and I wear it on my waist as evil Debbie I wear Torgo's hand around like a piece of jewelry <laughs> <laughs> Burn up hand. I love it. Wow. Yeah. Now, when you guys. But me and my dad made all that stuff the cauldron, all the hands. So, so Hal originally, originally titled the film Finger of Fate. Hmm. But then when he hired my dad, and my dad was so prolific with, uh, at that time, that was his hand stage. So, all those uh, sculpted hands on the fireplace mantle, those, that's all his pre existing work. Wow. And uh, so the cauldron of fire, the torgo hand, and the staff were hands being made specifically for the film. But other than that, and the painting, but uh, the rest of the hands in the film were pre-existing work. And that's when uh, Hal changed the name of the film, oh, Hands okay. of Fate. Mm -hmm. Well, that explains that, that kind does, of thing. That does. Well, what was it like for your dad? I mean, because when you did Miles Returns, okay, your dad got to play the character again, and he's much older than that. Did, did he talk to you about, wow, oh, this is weird, it's like deja vu, or, or how did, did, what did he say about it? Oh, he just had a good time. He was just so sweet, and my dad just was the sweetest guy. He just, he just had a cute little twinkle in his eye, and he was just happy to be just happy to be involved you know he just had a good time well that's good what was it i mean what was it like for you i mean here you are grown up now and and, and you're evil debbie and everything you couldn't be little debbie <laughs> anymore because of the pastry cakes but <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah yeah copyright infringement <laughs> yeah so, so what was it like for you to do that whole thing again and, and more than anything uh what was it like it was a little weird to know that, that torgo of course was played by a different actor now yeah, oh, I love our Torgo, Stephen Shields. He just, he came from L.A., we found him, and 
just love him. He did such a great job. Um, yeah. I mean, it's... I'm sorry John couldn't be around, but even if he could, who knows, you know? I, I kind of think he probably wouldn't have wanted to be involved. I don't know. I don't uh, know. Well, we're but, hoping it uh, gets gets out on DVD. Now, you said you, you think you might have a deal. I mean, is, is that right? At least you can kind of hint that... Yeah. You know, because, yeah, 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 at least for streaming, for now. All right, well, very good. I know there's some people that got it, and that was people that contributed to the Kickstarter. They got sent a DVD, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, and we've done a few screenings in different places. Uh, but, um, yeah, I'm just really anxious to get it out there. I know people are impatient. Well, they, it's been a long time. They're not being impatient. We need yeah. to get it out there. So. Well, now, but, well, yeah, we just, we've just we been talking, and uh, I think we we're on to a deal now. We got figured out. Oh, good. What was the what was the reaction from everybody uh, when they heard or found out that you guys did uh, essentially a second Monos film as you did Monos Returns and obviously everybody kind of knows the original and they kind of, you know, joke and say, oh, well, it's called, it's got the moniker of the worst film ever made. So did people just yeah. automatically assume that you guys were going for camp and, and cult cheese with the new one? How, what was the reaction? Probably. I mean, yeah, there's a, there's plenty of that. And I have to tell you, I'm, I'm a little nervous, cause, but I, I just got to have a thick skin. Like, a, I'll just pretend I'm seven years old, six years old again. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, no, I like it, and it's fun. And, uh, you know, we did the best job that we could with what we had, and we had some really great people and some talent and some some cool stuff uh we got uh oh shoot i can't remember what film he's in george stover what was he in he's in an mst film we got him uh to do a cameo for I us he's one of our our ghosts mm -hmm. in monos return so that was fun and then diane marie who played my mother in the original she lives in colorado and we flew her out, and she plays my mom again, and she's really kind of crazy and dingy because she's been stuck in the Valley Lodge for 50 years, too. So now that, No, that is. I'm glad you brought that up. That is awesome. The same woman, the same actress that played your mom in the film is, is in the sequel yes. you guys made. That's cool. So you, Oh, here's another thing that I really love. Nikki Mathis is uh, a wonderful singer. She went on to a, a very good career as a jazz singer, and um, I can't remember where she lives now, but Nikki Mathis was the original singer that sang Forgetting You on the soundtrack, which was a very good song. The soundtrack was actually pretty good. It, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and I found her when I was writing my book. I don't even remember how I found her, but I did. And uh, she agreed to re-record it. So on Monos Returns, she sings Forgetting You on our soundtrack. Well, that's great. Later. I'm a it's big really fan. Cool. I'm a big fan of, of B movie music. I, I think you know many more soundtracks should be put out, and and that sounds great. Wow. And, and you know the thing yeah. is so cool is is the fact that some of the people still around, and you have memories in that, which really helped you in writing your book. Why don't you talk a little bit about your book? Yes. Yes. Growing up with Monos the Hands of Fate. And then the long title is How I Was the Child Star of the Worst Movie Ever Made and Lived to Tell the Story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that was a great book. I wrote it with uh, help from Laura Mazuka Toops, who lives in Chicago. We met each other online on Facebook, and uh, she had edited a number of books, and I was impressed with her work. She's a huge fan. And so I just felt like even though I wrote the book, she edited it and just made it magic. Because I'm a pretty good writer, but I'd never written a book before. And so she helped me, and I actually, at the end, I flew to Chicago, spent a week, and we just sat down and we did our final edit together. And um, I'm very proud to say I'm five stars on Amazon. Wow. So it's available now still on Amazon, right? Or Oh, yeah. Very yeah, good. and uh, I've been so, I'm like I said, I'm an artist. I'm all over the map. I, 
but I'm trying to finish the audio version. I'm doing it myself because Debbie needs her own voice for this. That's right. right. That's exactly. right. Definitely. Uh, the book itself, I mean, is is a great thing, and and your paintings and all that. But but you really kind of are artistic in other ways too, don't you? Do like wall designs for homes? I mean, what is that you do? Yeah, I had uh, an over. Well, I'm still doing it. I just did a job last week, and I'm very proud that I. I'm 60 years old and I can still climb a ladder and I can still do this. But I did, uh, had over a 30 year career doing high end faux finish, mm. interior finish, and, and color consultation, color design. But I, like, I did the high roller lounge at the Chinook Winds Casino. I've done, uh, I, yeah, I do marbling, um, murals, all kinds of plaster techniques and, uh, if I can imagine it, I can figure out how to create it. I've etched uh, shower doors for people. I've done countertops with this stuff called skimstone that looks like poured concrete. I mean, if you can think of it, I I can figure out how to do it. And I just, I love that work. It was so varied and so much fun. And I always felt like I was getting paid to stair step, you know, yeah. climbing up and down a ladder all day. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, but I can still do it. I just, I just decide we're not going over, over ten foot walls anymore. Doing uh, staircases and stuff like that. <laughs> well, you're you're gonna be busy because between you know doing uh, what you do for a living, uh, this DVD comes out. I'm I'm sure that you should probably be scheduling a lot of appearances. I saw you on Facebook uh, yes. posting that question. I mean, you got any bites yet? I heard something about possibly Blobfest and. Yeah, I'm doing Cinema Wasteland again, for sure, and uh, I've been talking to a couple other people, but I definitely want to travel this next year. I want to do a lot of cons, and with, God, you know, the Debbie Chronicles, and and the remake, and Monos Returns, there's just so much going on, and there's so much in the past, you know, with um, Rachel Jackson's uh, Puppet Theater, Hands of Felt. Yeah, Monos, the Hands of Felt. Wow. <laughs> yeah, in fact, she's, she's our uh, assistant uh, uh, director for Monos Returns. And she's one of our wives in Monos Returns. Yeah, now, Rachel Jackson. Now, you know, Jackie, when these people are booking you for these appearances, they're actually not going to want to talk about Monos. They're going to want to talk about Curse of Bigfoot. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I can talk about that too. Yeah. You know yeah. something? We had a fun night. We 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 watched Monos and we watched The Curse of Bigfoot last night. Wow. Yeah. Is that fun for you, huh? And, and oh my god! The, I don't the, know how you did that. The creature looked like they took somebody's mother's old worn-out coat. It looks and, like, it looks and, like a velvet, like yeah. a velveteen teddy bear that you get from the dollar store. It's what uh, it looks uh, like. I read about that. That costume was actually supposed to be for uh, some sort of mummy film, and you know, oh my god. So yeah, Curse of Bigfoot. I think was actually the beginning of it was part of it was filmed in like. 1957, and then it was shelved, and then this this guy, this friend of my drama teacher in high school, um, oh, Flocker, Flocker is his last name, I can't remember his first name. <laughs> yeah, you gotta be careful how you pronounce that, because... <laughs> I know, I, I was very careful, did you see that? I go, Flocker. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> so yeah, he, uh, he contacted my drama teacher, and uh, he, we brought the drama class into school on a Saturday. The teacher, our, my teacher, Mr. Tackett, got the keys to the high school. Uh -huh. So we went in and we did this one scene. And anyway, in that one scene where you see me, the kid next to me with the, the really fuzzy curly hair and the thick glasses, yeah. uh -huh. his name is David. Oh, shoot. I can't remember his last name, David. But he was one of the kids in the Bad News Bears. Oh. The first oh. Bad News Bears. And I remember when he came to our school and in our drama class, he just would never let us forget that he was a professional actor. <laughs> <laughs> and then he ends up in the curse of Bigfoot. Sorry, <laughs> David. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't quite figure out, like, like they brought in a mummy thing. We're like, a mummy? And then come to find out that was the I Bigfoot. Know. and it just. But you were, you were in other things. I don't know if this is correct. IMDb is wrong half the time. 
But of course, it yes. mentions what is uh, Manos the Rise of Torgo? Is that another name for Manos? The Hands of Fate? Oh, uh, that's a whole other movie that somebody made. Uh, David Roy is his name, who made The Rise of Torgo. And um, he, had me, uh, he had me do like a little cameo, and I've actually never met him face to face. We filmed that. In my town, my friend uh, Rick Zunk actually filmed that scene of me. So I don't know. I've only seen it once. But it's, it's kind of based on Models to Hands of Fate, right? In a way? Yeah. 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 I can't really remember even what the um, what it's about. Well, Torgo. <laughs> now, it says you did something called Primal Range, The Legend of yeah. Conga. Is, is that a gorilla movie or something? No, Primal Rage, the the legend of um, no, what is it? Um, Conga. Shoot. No, that's that's wrong. That's not the right okay. word. But um, that is um, oh, what's his name? Patrick. Oh, Patrick McGee. Mm -hmm. You know uh, the the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, the Alien versus Predator. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the the alien, the guy in the alien costume, is. Patrick McGee. Okay. And he built that costume. That's what he does. Wow. And so he created his own film, his Bigfoot film, and he is the Bigfoot in the costume. He's six foot eight. He's a big guy. Wow. So, so there was another mono sequel that was supposed to happen a few years ago that did not happen, and I really don't want to talk about it. But um, <laughs> but I met Patrick McGee through uh, through a really cool guy Jay Lee who was the director of photography on that failed project, and then Jay got me in touch with Patrick because Patrick was finishing his Bigfoot film and wanted to do some filming in the forest mm -hmm. of Oregon, and I live in this most amazing place. I live in a town of a thousand people at the end of the road in western Oregon in the woods. And and uh, so Patrick brought his film crew to my town, and I got to be like the location manager for these scenes. And and I have a 16 foot beautiful teepee, so we set up the teepee in my backyard, and he did a scene of um, like a a healing scene. Mm -hmm. And I got to be the woman having um, some cancer taken out of my guts in the scene. And my ex-husband was the medicine man because he's a full-blood native. And my children and grandchildren got to be in the scene. Cool. So it was really cool. I mean, so they all came out, spent a couple days, and did some filming. And uh, so, yeah, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, your, your name was uh, Vera Six Final Trees? Eight. Your name was Vera what? Six Trees? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> And then it says you did a short called Just a Prick. Oh, Just a Prick. Let's see. Oh, that you, must have been for Joe Sherlock. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, I'm sitting in a parking lot at this little pub right now because uh, a movie I'm in is going to be screening here at 8 o'clock. And, um, and that's by Joe Sherlock. He's actually the director of photography for Monos Returns. Mm. And... He, he does uh, beer and booby movies. <laughs> no, just, my movies are not in any of his movies. So don't be thinking that. But, um, but, but yeah, Dark Zone 13, that's the one we're watching tonight. Boy, I can see how that could get confused. you got to make sure you clarify that like you just did. Well, because say, cause you were also in Playboy. Yeah, because so. you were also in Playboy, but it wasn't a pictorial, so you got to make sure people no, understand that. But, but i, but I got to just say, i got to say this real quick, is that when the Playboy article came out in 2015, my younger son was um, basically graduating high school. You know, he's, he's like a teenager and I come in with the magazine, I'm showing him, I'm waving it around, I go, honey, guess what? Your mom's in Playboy magazine. Oh. And, you have, and you have to realize we live in a town of a thousand people, and I was head of the Arts Council, and I was on the school board, <laughs> and my brother-in-law was the mayor. So my son, every bit of color left his face. Just, I, he came from his whole high school class with like 18 kids, oh my and God. they all hung out at my house. 
So yeah, he was pretty horrified. Because nobody ever figured out that Playboy also had articles. <laughs> nobody knew that. Oh. They just <laughs> lost right over it. And, and, and so there's one more here I wanted to find out about, Beyond the Wall of Fear. Yeah, that's another Joe Sherlock movie, and he's doing a whole, uh, every Tuesday night in Corvallis, Oregon, near where I live, he's doing his movies every Tuesday in October, and uh, that one's going to be showing next month, so I'm going to go see that, too. Very cool. And I get killed in his movies. I get killed in every movie. It's like, dang it, by monsters. Well, well, I, I well, love. Maybe I'll get some revenge in uh, the Debbie Crosby. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I love you know the, the very last scene of Monos where they they show you and you know your little child, and and <laughs> you're you're wearing that cute little dress, but you look annoyed for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. Oh, I probably was annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's an amazing thing knowing that when they shot, I guess they could only shoot thirty two seconds of film at a time, and there was a lot of editing, but it, yes. it turned out well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll have to read that article, The Hand That Time Forgot, yeah. by Richard Grant, because he, he, when he talked to Bob and Bernie, they talk about that sort of thing, about those 32-second shots and running out of film and having to use stuff that they didn't want to use. And <laughs> right. my, my favorite thing is when you kept saying to hell... I'm doing this over. He's like, no, we'll fix it in post. And you said that you were thinking, man, movie making must be magic if they can fix this. <laughs> it is. God, no kidding. <laughs> All right. Well, Jack, well, Jackie, before, uh, before we make you late for your screening, I, I want to let you go. But I wanted to thank you for coming on and chatting with us for so long. Uh, where can uh, fans catch up with you online if they want to keep abreast of everything that's happening and coming up? Oh, yeah. Uh, Debbie's Monos on Facebook. That's a really good place to find me. Debbie's Monos. All right, perfect. And we and look then, forward and to seeing... My, my website, too, uh, jackiesarts.com. Mm-hmm. You can see my work. And that's, just so everybody knows, it's J-A-C-K-E-Y. Anyway, yes, thank you. All right. And they can, I mean, I mean, is there paintings you have for sale? Yes, yes. Very yeah, good. I have paintings for sale. Uh, I teach two-hour painting classes, those wine and sip parties. Mm-hmm. I was just thinking the, about doing some Monos-related ones to fans that are nearby. I'll, I'll go as far as Portland to teach a Monos painting party. Yeah, that, and, that's pr- and you know, remember back in the 80s, they had Hands Across America? They should have you as a chairman <laughs> if they ever bring that back. There you go. <laughs> right? Hands across. That's awesome. Wow. Okay. All right. Well, Jackie, Great. I want to thank you so much you for joining me us. Another, you just gave me another idea. Dang it. Okay. There we go. <laughs> you should be working on that thank because you. she's a workaholic. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we hope you have fun at your screening, and uh, keep in touch. We'd love to have you come back on in the future once more happens with the Debbie Chronicles, and, you know, if you want to promote anything else. And the release of the DVD. Yeah. Hopefully we're going to see that soon. Yes, very soon. Thank you so much, and I will keep in touch. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your weekend. Uh Uh-huh. You too. Bye-bye.